People wonder, what's in the water here? Flip back through the pages and paragraphs of this community's history and you can see why that's a question asked with a straight face and a notebook in hand. This place, it's got a gift for peering beyond the horizon, for resilience in the face of adversity. Over the past century and a half, it's attracted farmers, craftspeople, industrialists, academics, and tech startups to its streets and fields. And it's rolled with the punches. It's dusted itself off following the decline of manufacturing and the automotive nosedive. It's redefined its image, marrying new ideas with old buildings, breathing life into abandoned spaces. Recently, like others, Waterloo Region began to push its urban limits towards the countryside, sprawling across the rich fields that give us food, groundwater, and a special connection to a rural landscape. But unlike many others, it sat up and took notice that a unique way of life was slowly eroding. In a community of three robust cities and four pastoral townships, maintaining a rural-urban balance is no easy feat. But that's the tightrope this community walks every day. Waterloo Region had a decision to make. Allow the urban limits to push further into its farmland or contain that growth in the downtown cores. It would be a hard decision that would shape the community for generations to come and establish these past few years as a historic period in the ongoing story of Waterloo Region. Am I clean enough for this? Am I presentable oh, yeah. enough for this? Yeah, it's slightly really mess. Yeah. This is perfect. <laughs> okay, okay. This is Makita. Hey, Makita. This is our dog, Makita. How's it going? Come on, puppy. Um, I grew up on this farm. My dad grew up on this farm. And um, what? He didn't really grow up yet. He didn't really grow up yet, he says, but <laughs> <laughs> lived here as from, a, from a young age. How, how long has this farm been in the, in the family? Over 200 years. Wow. Yeah. So my grandma and grandpa had this as a dairy operation previously, and then he um, changed it to organic farm when I was just after I was born, just before I was born, so in 1986. We supply products from not only our farm, but probably four or five other farms as well. So it's sort of like a supply, sort of like a cooperative, I guess. Yeah. This is my brother, Daniel. Daniel, how's it going? I'm TJ. Dan. Nice, nice to meet you. you. And this is Ian. Hey, Ian. And that's the camera. No, that's the camera, yeah. <laughs> the famous camera. So Daniel raises chickens. We sell eggs. And um, I have a community garden that I rent space out to about five or six other people. And so we just grow vegetables for ourselves. It's home. It's what we yeah. did. We didn't spend much time inside unless it was raining. And even then, we were probably outside running around, climbing trees, doing whatever. Um, early mornings, I remember as a kid, come out and start the three-wheeler, just go ripping around on the three-wheeler for <laughs> An hour or two, whatever. If it got too cold, we'll put something else on and come back outside and help dad in the shop. 
I think it really um, taught me how to be connected to nature. I have um, have such an appreciation for that connection. I think it really teaches hard work and like oh, yeah. I am who I am as a result of it. Not only growing up on a farm, but growing up on a farm that advocates for um, taking care of the soil, being connected to the land, learning that that's where our resources come from, and also that our health is dependent upon it. I remember as a kid, it would take us half an hour to get to the edge of the city, and now it only takes about 10 minutes because there's suburban sprawl happening everywhere. That belt of Southern Ontario is the best agricultural land in all of Canada. Putting concrete in cities on top of it is, I don't think, the best use of our of our resources. Kitchener-Waterloo is growing drastically, and I think that's a much more responsible urban planning. Instead of spreading out, growing up, right, and intensifying the downtown area. The province told us a number of years ago that we had to plan for a 50% increase in population, so 750,000 people within the next 30 years. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can just keep building out and out and out and sprawl further and further into greenfield areas, or you can try to balance the growth by having a lot of that growth uh, being intensification. I took a report to council and say, now what are we going to do? Are we going to continue to flop out and grow or have uh, have sprawl or what will we do to, to maintain this uh, lifestyle that we have here and this kind of economy we have here. Because land has traditionally been so plentiful in North America, we have seen suburban sprawl. But here in Canada especially, we can't really afford that because we have very little land that you can grow anything on. Southern Ontario has some beautiful farmland and we need to preserve it. And I think there certainly is a respect for food here and a respect for how you get it. And perhaps some of that has to do with the fact that we are a municipality that's partially urban and partially rural, which makes us different from other municipalities. So we have that interplay and we have that discussion every time regional council sits down. We were going to uh, constrain sprawl, constrain the growth of the urban centers and actually grow up. Part of the, the mechanism, the tool for doing that was really using transit as the, as the planning tool. And uh, Jerry Thomas was very key in that. So in uh, the early 2000s, I was Commissioner of Transportation and Environmental Services at the time, and my predecessor as Regional CAO was Jerry Thompson. And uh, I remember uh, Jerry inviting me into his boardroom one day, and uh, there was plans spread out along this long boardroom table. Uh, you know, the map of the community from Waterloo down to Cambridge, and uh, Jerry had marked it up with magic marker and little arrows and notes, and he was both a planner and an engineer. And he said, what do you think of this? You know, we're gonna build a rapid transit system. And, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, was head of engineering at the time, and I must say, I was a bit dubious. So at one point, he called me into his boardroom and had this huge map laid out that had a, a convention center and a transit hub and a whole bunch of things added into it at that particular point in time. And my first reaction was, that you really think I can sell this? That's the founder, George Rumpel, who started the Berlin Felt Company. He became what was called the Felt King of Canada. He made so much felt and felt footwear. That was his claim to fame. That's his son, Walter, my grandfather. And uh, this is my father, John. George died in 1916, and his son, Walter, then took over the felt part of the operation, and he died in 1944 at a fairly young age. Both were young when they died. And then my father, John, uh, succeeded, and then I came in with my father. It was a family affair. We all worked together. It was an interesting place. We had a lot of 50-year employees over the years. You don't get that now. The early settlers here were uh, the Mennonites, but then we had a lot of uh, German migrations in the 19th century. They weren't uh, upper-class Germans. They were middle-class and, and uh, peasants and farmers and craftspeople who came in without a class structure. And this sense of stewardship that I think is born out of the Mennonite tradition here, this sense of stewardship was not only uh, available to deal with people, but also their attitudes toward, towards land and land preservation and how they, they do things locally. So we have a, a strong sense of stewardship, no class structure, and a get-up-and-go, very utilitarian get-up-and-go that we, do, we need to do the things we need to keep going in the future. I would agree that the culture here, no matter your ethnic background, is to be practical. 
I think that's certainly something that's just woven into the way people do business here. Uh, when people say, well, what's in the water in Waterloo, or why is it different than other communities? It is, it's a unique ability to, to value what's in the past, but also do what's important for the future. They built the expressway because they needed to uh, move people around this region. They did that in the 1960s and 70s on, on, their, on their own. Um, when they needed more um, engineers, they created the University of Waterloo and uh, co-op education, all those sorts of models which drove the university ahead and, and created all sorts of incentives to start and do things here. I met David. Uh, he was my lab instructor in my second year. And uh, I chased him all over the place and he wouldn't give me the time of day. And then after I wrote the exam that he was working with, then he phoned me up and asked me out. You were making sure she had the right grade, were you? <laughs> I was in co-op engineering and basically at the cutting edge of the new co-op program. One of my assignments uh, was working for the physics department and I ran labs and tutorials and she was in one of my classes. You asked about George Rumpel. He definitely tried to increase the value of the uh, city of Berlin and uh, bring more people in and expand industry. There were 14 industrialists got together, put up the money and brought in a planner from New York City by the name of Levitt. They paid his way up, put together his ideas and uh, came up with a, a few suggestions. That was 1914 when Levitt presented this. The war had broken out, the city of Berlin uh, ended up in turmoil because of all the problems of being a German city and uh, they sort of dropped a lot of their future plans to try and straighten out uh, their internal problems. When it got shelled at the beginning of the war, uh, they did get from this, they established bylaws for the growth of the city. Uh, they realized the effect of planning that it had on the city. So when it was res resurrected in 1925, um, they were using these concepts because this group of industrialists with Bright Up and Lang and, and Rumpel really knew that with all the railroads, with all the production, they had to have some organization. And so there were benefits. I think there were a couple of things that brought me around. And so one was a trip uh, that I took to Calgary and Portland. Met with city officials, met with private business owners, uh, and especially in Portland, saw the transformational impact that their LRT system had had on that community. It also got me realizing that there are very, very few tools that municipalities have to make a transformational impact. There are very few tools. We can do lots of things incrementally. We can incrementally add bus service or we can you know, incrementally change where we build our roads. But that's all incrementalism. There's very few things we can do that's transformational. And Building a rapid transit system is one of those very few things. So I was convinced pretty early on. I saw the argument. I saw the, the transit piece is critical to shaping the, the urban form here. And the urban form was what was important to me. Because uh, if we didn't do this type of thing and, and created a compact urban form, that we would lose everything we had in terms of our environment, our rural land preservation, and, and the sense of community we have here. And I wasn't prepared to let go of that, and I think many others weren't either. Driving up north on the Trans Canada Highway. The night is sweet, thousands times. I'm driving up north on the Trans Canada Highway. Hey! The night is sweet, thousand stars. Should I stay with you? I know. Spike, Should I stay with you? Know. Should I stay with you? I know now. Beer everywhere. Don't want to leave anymore. Want to be a home of. Oh, I'm certainly 
Waterloo Region has some of the same challenges that a lot of communities that grew up so much and, and grew out so much uh, in sort of the post-war period face, which is that the communities weren't designed to be easily accessible by mass transit. They were designed to facilitate folks driving around in single cars. Transit in our community for a long time um, was not serving people terribly well. Um, and there have been a lot of changes that have happened in the last 15, 20 years that have been really meaningful in terms of how um, useful and, and valuable that service is. January 1st, 2000, the region assumed responsibility for transit. And so prior to that, there had been Kitchener Transit and Cambridge Transit. And actually, you know, prior to January 1st, 2000, you could not take public transit between Kitchener and Cambridge. So it was no longer a local service. We were able to cross those local boundaries, connect Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo, have it really be seamless. A transit system is only as good as the service you provide. If you don't provide good service, people will not use your transit system. And good service requires investment. So that started us on a path of really dramatic investment in transit and really significant increase in transit service. When I was door knocking in the 2010 election helping out on a campaign, there were many places in the ward I was working on that I couldn't get to by bus. By the time 2014 rolled around, there were two new express bus services that meant that I could get from my place to just about anywhere in the ward. We ramped up uh, transit service and we saw transit ridership increase dramatically. And so that became a key piece of the puzzle, a key sort of building block is we could now integrate regional land use planning, public transit planning, and transportation planning, and put all those pieces together and say, okay, how do we want to shape this growing urban community? One of the fundamental recommendations that council approved way back when was, we are trying to build um, an LRT system from the north end of Waterloo to downtown Cambridge. There's the vision, is we're gonna build, in the fullness of time, LRT from one end of the community to the other. I was actually on a bus with my boyfriend, now husband, and uh, he said to me, well, I hear they're thinking about putting in a you know, light rail transit system. And I thought about it for a minute and said, well, that sounds like a good idea. Um, and didn't at that time know uh, what we were in for in the next many years. This is a community that was very much built on car commuting. So a lot of people saying we're spending all this money and what for? I'm never going to use that. I'm in my car. I'm not going to get out of my car because the ion is so far away. It has nothing to do with me and yet I'm being asked to pay all this you know, all these taxes for it. We've gone through three municipal elections yes. uh, where this project was probably the, the key issue. The very first election that hit was sort of more of a philosophical discussion and, you know, this is where we're heading, this is the kind of thing we're looking at and there weren't dollar figures attached to it. The second one, it was pretty clear what the project was and what the, what the scale of it was and, and there was organized opposition. So there were, you know, strongly held views on all sides of this. There were people who were passionate that we needed to build this, this was the right thing to do. There were other people who were also quite passionate that, you know, we didn't have the technology choice right, or this was too expensive. They were concerned about impacts on property taxes. Part of the reason we had the ION was to get growth concentrated in the core areas and keep it away from the edge of the city, in part so that we could preserve the farmland that we have, the beautiful rich farmland that we have outside the city areas. But I don't think people understood that. It, it can be really difficult for people going about their day-to-day -day lives to have a good sense of the land use planning goals of the project. Because that's not something most people spend much time thinking about, how our community grows, what shape our community takes. A couple of councillors ran specifically that they were going to end the project um, and one of the uh, one of the very verbal uh, opponents in the in the media kept saying well let's have a referendum let's have a referendum and then when the election took place the person had their referendum because it was quite clear that everybody who supported the project was re-elected and re-elected by substantial margins i was helping out with a municipal campaign in one of the local tier municipalities um, which doesn't deal with lrt but 
despite the fact that, you know, I wasn't there to talk to them about the level of government that was dealing with this, it, it was by the end of the election almost impossible to go to most stores without hearing someone bring up LRT. So it really became the big issue that uh, everyone had heard that they were supposed to care about. I would say people came forward in a respectful, well thought out way and like truly, it sounds a bit hokey, it truly was democracy in action. Okay, the first delegation is Kate Daly from Waterloo. Welcome, Kate. Uh, tensions had risen a bit, but I, I also wouldn't say that um, the community was opposed. I know that there was a tendency in uh, some of the papers and other places for people to try to characterize it that way. I can understand why they do that if they weren't supportive of the project. But for the most part, I think there were some folks who were really upset. There were some folks who had been convinced to be upset. There were a bunch of folks who didn't know what to think, and there were those of us who had decided that the project was the right way to go. There is huge awareness of this issue, as all of the polls have shown. There is huge anticipation for the decision that's being made here tonight. And we all know it's all been said. People have had a chance to have their say on this issue. And I'm quite proud to say that so many in this community that I love have, have been involved. It's not that we all agree, but we all know it's time for a decision. Mostly what I wanted to say to Regional Council was that I had learned a lot and that it was possible to have meaningful conversations, even in a climate like that, with people about the future of the community and the decisions we make now to support it. The future of our community rests on this decision, and tonight I want to learn that I am right to have confidence in those we have elected to represent us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. It was a difficult decision. We had to rely on a lot of experts, a lot of uh, experience that other communities had. Listen to delegations after delegations and emails after emails of people on one side or another of yes or no or what technology to use and of course that goes through your mind at night and you're trying to sort these uh, things out and uh, you're not always going to please everybody and uh, you, you make these important decisions you don't take these lightly and vote Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That is the result of the light rail transit debate of the last eight and a half years. There's that sort of iconic photo that uh, I think many folks in the community have seen of, of kind of a bunch of people spontaneously jumping up and there's one fellow holding a bicycle helmet above his head. Um, but it, it was one of those kind of spontaneous moments of elation, of course, entirely out of keeping with council expectations of decorum. Um, but it was, I think, understandable under the circumstances. After the vote, Almost everybody in the, in the audience stood up and applauded, and I've never seen that before. And that was a really a magical moment. You felt like we were taking a giant step forward. For those of you who have been here before when I've been chairing public meetings, you realize that I would not allow that kind of decorum. <laughs> Tonight is an exception. Thank you for uh, your uh, show of support. That day was, was in some ways the end of a process, but also the beginning of an even bigger process of hiring a, a partner to work with us, to, to design the system, to build the system, eventually getting to the point where we actually had that first shovel in, in the ground. The biggest challenge has been the number of challenges and the ongoing series of challenges. The vehicles from Bombardier, that's been an ongoing challenge. Uh, that's been a frustration. You know, you sort of think, oh, we got the funding done there. You know, we can take a deep breath. Well, that then just launched us into whole other things or, you know, there, we finally got regional council approval to proceed with the project. You think, oh, you know, take a deep breath. Well, then that just launched us into construction. I've always characterized it as more of a civil infrastructure project. So we replaced water mains, storm sewers, sanitary sewers. 
We moved utilities, natural gas, electrical, bell. All of that had to be moved. Some of it was over 100 years old and, and had to be replaced. When people saw a 10 meter deep holes in front of uh, Grand River Hospital, we didn't need that to put a train system in place, but we needed to do that to replace and move the infrastructure that was there. So it's almost more of a urban civil infrastructure revitalization project with the light rail transit project thrown in on top of it. Construction is, is never a lot of fun and when you're building in the middle of a community, the urban center of a community with the businesses and the people, uh, it's a lot of stress for, for everyone, it's a lot of impact on everyone. Construction was a really challenging time. We had a lot of roads dug up uh, all at the same time, so that had a negative impact on a lot of people. And I think, you know, it was probably a low point, uh, and I think probably was more disruptive than most people anticipated. Uh, it was actually a little more disruptive than I thought it would be. Um, so, you know, that created some challenges. At the same time as that was happening though, there was significant development happening around the station areas and along the corridor. So new condos, some repurposed office building, brand new office. And so at the same time as people were seeing all these negative construction impacts, hard to get around, they were seeing tons of cranes and tons of new construction. And so I think they could see, hmm, this is actually achieving already uh, what we talked about. I personally just made the move downtown uh, last year, first, uh, first 40 years of my life in a you know, suburban Waterloo and finally said okay it's time to make that shift and, and bring my family down and, and, and so now we live down in Victoria Park and, and uh, loving it, loving it. But every weekend in the summer and, and throughout the year there is something to do. You know, last weekend was multicultural fest, and a couple weekends from now we're gonna have rib fest. Well, that's great because I don't have to get in my car and do. I just literally walk out my door, and, and I'm in the middle of something cool, yeah. and and uh, and that that I that I love, and my kids, you know, my kids love it too. bands and fireworks and ice cream and you know stuff to do right and, and so yeah it's just it's a it's a great way to live to me that's the number one thing in, in, in sort of turning this corner and it's, it's getting more bodies down here getting getting more people in into these cafes and these restaurants and into the pubs and and and, and sort of having more of a lively post 5 p.m. and, and weekend uh, group. Early 2000s, a couple of the early projects in, in this uh, in this area would have been obviously the Kaufman Loss, one of the one of the first uh, projects to go that sort of kicked things off. At that time, I remember thinking when the when the sales launched, uh, you know, who, who in the right mind is going to rest their head at the corner of King and Victoria and buy a residential condo? I wasn't convinced at, at, at that time. I, I, one of my partners uh, bought a bought a condo there. Actually, he was rewarded for it, uh, you know, for having that foresight. Uh, then, of course, we had the, uh, the School of Pharmacy with University of Waterloo coming downtown. That, that was another key piece in, in, in changing people's mindset about what was happening downtown. Followed, of course, by the tannery, the, the tech companies that sort of embraced that. And, 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 and so, so, you know, employment started to, to slowly grow alongside some of the, you know, institutional and residential projects. Um, and then with just with every sort of 
passing year, something else, you know, something else kind of came into the fold. And, and now we look out and we see obviously a beautiful bright up block building with, with uh, Google and you know, 200, 220,000 square feet. We're staring down at the, at the future uh, transit hub site. You know, we have, we have great hopes. We have that link now to, to Union Station and, and of course, you know, the million, plus or minus million square feet of commercial, retail, maybe hotel, convention, you know, these types of things that, that get built into that project. Ideally, that, that uh, you know, that's, that's another massive step in, in sort of transforming this core. Watch the grooves. Help the famous employees shows. There was machinery that was sitting just in this area here. It uh, was part of the carding or combing machinery for the fibers. I still have a uh, big uh, arch off the one of the machines that I kept as a, a souvenir. Mm. It was sad to see those things uh, scrapped. And that's why I got such a, a, a chuckle out of seeing when they auctioned off these things. Uh, you know, the, uh, the old order communities from Waterloo County coming in and knowing the value of these things and taking them because they were familiar with using them. Our equipment, some of it, was scattered throughout the world. Uh, some of it people didn't want because in North America, the textile industry, which we're part of, uh, had been tapering down for years and there was just surplus equipment. Yeah. Nobody could really find a use for it. This was my office and uh, spent, spent a, a few years in here. here. Yeah. In the pharmacy school, that whole landscape down there was a tire factory at one point. I worked there as a... Uh, and a work term. That was my you? first work term at uh, UW Engineering working for VF Goodrich in their tire plant just down here. It's a lot of changes in this area. Today's a moving day for us. Yeah. A lot of butterflies and uh, kind of a reality check that this is all going to happen really quick. This building is going to change in about three days. The team is a little bit antsy, you could say, and anxious, because most breweries are outside the core areas, right? So we're dealing with, dealing with some tight corners and roofs that are at different heights. But, uh, you know, a lot of creative thinking, and uh, we really are excited to show everybody what, what's going what's gonna to happen in three or four months when we open the doors. When we would meet as shareholders and we were thinking about expansion, we didn't want to go to Toronto or anywhere where we didn't know. We, we like playing in our own backyard and Kitchener is part of our backyard and the only space that ever was mentioned in our meetings was the tannery. If we were ever going to open up somewhere in Kitchener, it'd be the tannery. We thought, oh, the chances of that happening are pretty slim. And then one day, a, a, a space opened up the tannery and the landlord came to us and was like, hey, we really like A-Burb, we'd love it if you open up a brew pub in the tannery. We're like, well, that's the only spot we've ever talked about, so how can we say no? Abraham Herb came up on his own and then brought his brother up later on. He started his grist mill very close to Uptown Waterloo. He created a, a central manufacturing hub right off the bat by, by opening up the grist mill. He drained a lot of the wetlands to uh, make farmable land, which allowed uh, other Mennonites from Pennsylvania to come up and have land to work on. He also actually housed a lot of people in their migration. He did a lot for this town and he created the foundation. We're, st look, we're still talking about him yeah. today. 
downtown Waterloo had the street closed and they were excavating and they found this wooden log road underneath and they left it open so people could come and see it. And it was incredible. It was 200 years old. It was a road from Abraham Erb's grist mill and sawmill where the tracks cross King Street in uptown Waterloo, leading to his home, which is was 172 King Street South. It's a white house that's now a lawyer's office. It's still there. And you can see where he used to go. And of course, it was very the land was originally very swampy when the first settlers started to build on it. So they had these log roads. And eventually, that road was part of a bigger road that took you from First Mennonite Church on King and Sterling all the way to this grist mill. It was an incredibly important moment in our history to be able to look back. It was almost like being in a time machine. It was magical. And it was a gift that we got from looking forward. We suddenly got this glimpse of the past. And I remember they took the, um, the logs from the corduroy road. They left it out so people could, could see it in its place. And they took the logs and they cut them up into 100 pieces and they gave them away. My ancestors probably walked on it. With a name like Martin, it's pretty easy to guess that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm interested in just having a piece, and uh, we often have people visit us from other countries and from other parts of our country, so I'm interested in having it just for a kind of a conversation piece. What time did you get here? 11.30 last night. Came here after work. <laughs> yeah. Anybody watching on Facebook Live can see that that's our piece. Is that our piece that's of wood? That's your piece. Okay. You, you're gonna put that in the I'm trunk. I'm gonna put it in the trunk. That one, that one. Get that one. Yeah. So much. The facility that was giving them out opened at 7 a.m. By 7.30, everything was gone. Everything was given away. But that's how hungry people are to know where they've come from. It was an amazing, magical moment. The fact that everybody was so enamored of that corduroy road shows how important those old artifacts are to us. And yet it's changing so fast that we can't keep track. No one could deny that there's now a brewery here on the corner of Charles and Victoria. It's a great image for, you know, repurposing the building, bringing it back to its industrial roots, and we're also going to create a whole new experience here at the tannery with the ION. I'm constantly amazed that there's a lot of people still who don't travel to Waterloo if they live in Kitchener. People are habitual. So, you know, the LRT is going to pass in front of both places. That's an obvious, direct, very physical link, and I think for once, um, we get to sort of feel like a real city. You're gonna have people coming across from different parts of the city that you would never encounter on your daily basis. But here at the tannery, where we've got these beautiful long tables here, you're gonna be sitting beside them one day and you're gonna experience your neighbor in a totally different way. We are here in downtown Kitchener and we're here to meet you know, the changing lifestyle, people moving back downtown and celebrating their lives together as a community and you know, walking more, getting out more, socializing more, getting the finer things in life. It's all really exciting, you know. After two years of being closed, a section of King Street from uh, Wellington to Victoria was opened. And it was just completely changed. It was like, it was this new futuristic landscape that was different from what you knew. So King Street at the train tracks um, near Victoria used to cross the tracks and they used to be level with each other. Now all of a sudden the tracks are high and King Street is way lower and it's going underneath this overpass. And this, this little shopping strip mall um, beside it suddenly is now up on a hill where it used to be level with the, with the road. And a condo building was going up and I talked to one of the construction workers. I walked around there uh, before it was even open to traffic. And I said to him, I don't remember what used to be here. Do you remember? And he looked and he said, you know, I went to school every day. I pass this place every day and I don't remember. Which shows how quickly our memories diminish of the landscape we had. You just look at the wear on the stairs and, and you can see those feet going up and it's everything from old boots to new boots and, and uh, you know, people that uh, are long gone.
it was really a family business. And that, that feeling is still alive. You know, a lot of times uh, a factory is closed and the people are gone, they move on. Whereas you keep running into people who are talking about things. They still get together and have Christmas parties. And, and uh, you know, they all came back and doors open and they're sitting there hooting away looking at the video of themselves when they were considerably younger. Uh, running machines and you know playing tricks on each other and walking around covered in wool felt you know that was just hanging from them like sheep. It was an atmosphere where when they they closed this place down they made sure everybody had training and tried to get jobs for the next people going and uh, the last pink slip was your own. That's right I was the last one here. Not too many uh, operations run four generations like we did, and we, we had our kids in here as well, which was fifth. You see that it's time to move along, and unfortunately it fell in my lap. I did not like to have to close the business, but I realized that its time had come, and uh, we could not justify running anymore. And uh, it uh, worked out that this was the way it was going to be. This was part of the heritage of the area. We had, you know, uh, shoemaking, we had uh, button manufacturing, clock manufacturing. We all should be proud of this. And we were proud that we were in the felt business. I came to work for the record in 1984. People in Kitchener were talking about how awful the downtown was, how nothing that happened could build it up or help it recover from the growth of the suburban shopping malls around it. Over time, the downtown was a constant concern. As soon as I got to Kitchener in the mid-1980s, the Burns Meat Packing Plant um, closed. It was a few decades after that that we lost Schneider's, but it was an ongoing thing the whole time. The Bud plant is gone. Uh, automobile factories are gone. The BF Goodrich Tire, that huge factory on Strain Street, was gone, the tire factory in, in back of uh, Fairway Road was gone. They just kept disappearing, and you knew that something would have to replace it or we'd be just hollowed out in our economy. With some really intentional regional policies, planning policies that were encouraging intensification, in the early 2000s, we started to see a shift. All the cities, Kitchener, Waterloo, and Cambridge were focused on how do we revitalize our downtowns? How do we encourage people to live and work there? Mayor Carl Zair, he brought in um, uh, an investment fund that invested in the cleaning up the tannery, which is now, of course, the home of Communitech and all of those startups and all of those high-tech companies. That started the foundation for the, for the tech center that downtown Kitchener has. And this was before any construction started for the ION. Over the last uh, five to six years, we've seen major changes downtown, and some of that's been premised on the fact that there will be better transit and uh, bringing jobs into the core. We're bringing jobs in the core. We're actually bringing people back to live into the core. I think those are jobs and, and uh, residents are critical to making downtowns uh, successful, and I think the evidence is uh, beginning to show itself. I sense that uh, people do see that there's been billions of dollars invested in growth around the ION corridor. You've got all these tech workers coming in, and that's not totally related to ION, but it's not totally separate from it. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a, a symbiotic change. You've got all kinds of things happening, and you see that this is part of something bigger that is going to benefit everybody. We were on probably a similar path to most mid-sized communities in Ontario and in Canada. I think if we hadn't done something you know, dramatically different. We might have, you know, shifted that a little bit, but I don't think we would have shifted it as much as we have. The future changes as well. Getting the trains and carrying passengers, I think will drive even more changes in this community. I lived here my entire life. You didn't come down here at night sometimes. You're gonna see after 5 p.m. on a Friday night today, that people are staying till 1 a.m. And people have said that just walking by, they've never seen the parking lot busy after 6 p.m. I think Waterloo Region is some has the best fertile soil for entrepreneurship. People come and try things here, startups, you know, incubators, Communitech, Google, because the soil is so fertile. It allows you to be experimental, right? And that's, that's Waterloo Region. 
the, the theme, I guess, going around the tech community is if you don't have a head office in Kitchener, Waterloo right now, and you're in Toronto, Ottawa, or Silicon Valley, get an office. Bridge is a construction software company, um, and Lauren and I started the company when we were in our final year of university at Western, um, and it was really through going from job site to job site and just asking questions around what was frustrating on site um, that gave us the idea to build an app for the construction industry. Bridget has been around for about four years now, and we've seen a lot of growth, and we've grown the team. Um, from just the two of us to about 35 people. To kind of see all of that actually come to life has just been, you know, pretty surreal. And I know sometimes we look back and we're like, wait, what? Like from that first time we walked on a job site and we heard about this one problem, we actually now have an entire team around us and investors and customers um, all in support of what we're trying to do. It's pretty exciting to, to see that actually happen. Lauren's from Stratford and I'm from Ottawa and we graduated from Western so we'd been living in London, moved here um, with this company we had started. It was just you know the two of us still at that point and we didn't really know where to go um, and it was another entrepreneur that we know that had suggested that we go to Communitech so we literally just showed up. They really took us in and helped us get our feet on the ground and then helped us you know really kind of figure out the ecosystem, find office space and do all of that. The history of the building is really interesting. I think it's the same thing we're seeing with a lot of the, you know, old factory buildings here in town where, you know, tech companies are starting to take over those old buildings, you know, totally refurbish them and it's created this really interesting kind of downtown environment. I know when we started to look for an office space, we really wanted um, something with a lot of character and that's why one of the older buildings in town made a lot of sense for us. And there's all of these buildings here downtown that were previously abandoned and hadn't really been used in the past while. And so as more and more companies started to move in, um, you know, it's kind of natural to look for those uh, old spaces that, you know, you can kind of make new again. I think my ancestor would be very pleased that uh, the property would see a new use as part of a transit center because in the 1914 plan that uh, he was involved in with a uh, planner from New York City, Lovett, the uh, whole area here was going to be designated as a transit center. So guess what? This is the future. <laughs> this is the future. This area is going to be a continuation of using the railroad and uh, transportation. It's uh, quite a change, and yet it is not a change. George would be happy you carried on the baton. Yes. <laughs> well, there's certainly been a lot of change in the region over the years, but I think one of the characteristics that's consistent is that we've managed to preserve a lot of our rural countryside, a lot of the farming operations are out there so that all the cities have expanded uh, within their envelopes. They're all centrally located by and large. And so we still have a very, uh, very good balance between rural and urban settings. And so the urban settings have expanded and grown ex sort of exponentially in some ways, but yet we still maintain a strong, vibrant far farming community and rural community. This plot is, is rented to this incredible man, Dave Chappelle. He built me a compost this year, which I'm super excited about. And then I have a plot in the middle. Yeah, but it's, it's way too much for me to do by myself. And lots of people from the city want to have places to grow food, so why not share this space? Because it's good soil. It's really incredible soil. <laughs> I'll take this one. <laughs> Here we are at Vibrant Farms in Baden. We're checking out uh, some of the uh, grounds here. More importantly, some of the chickens that we raise for one of our menu items. During a burbs time, everything was consumed locally, grown locally, manufactured locally. And so we're just trying to embody that philosophy uh, in the restaurant, trying to uh, uh, give uh, just to the name. It's great to come out to the farm and see it, this whole process and, and hear how everything is done and how all, even the feed for the chicken is coming from like across the road. Uh, it's all organic and, and, and all natural and um, very sustainable. We like to think that Abraham Herb built this town with his bare hands and I mean, um, he kind of did in a way, right? What people appreciated in those days was their hard work and uh, maybe he did enjoy a nice 
pint of, of uh, beer after his hard day of work. An honest pint is always a way to appreciate a day. He's the founder of the principles that we believe in and the integrity, the solidarity, the craftsmanship that, that we believe in today as well. You know, there's a long history here in Waterloo Region of uh, of industry and of reinventing yourself. It starts with uh, the Mennonite history and, uh, and, and doing things proactively. And so we've been ahead of the curve on a, on a lot of things. So as the manufacturing industries were phasing out, then we were able, fortunately, to bring in the, the knowledge industry, the IT and the high tech industry. So it's a community that's always reinvented itself uh, economically. Um, uh, as, as society changed and jobs changed and technologies changed that the business people here had an ability to transform themselves and reinvent themselves. So the building of the island is totally consistent with our past history is that we, we do the things we need to do to keep moving out into the future and uh, make the good, good investments and, and people move with them. They may argue at the time there was great controversy over building the expressway, uh, there was controversy over building the island, but I think all of these things are moving the community ahead. So when you build these things, they're not always fully appreciated at the time that they're conceived, at the time that they're built, at the time that they uh, begin operation. Um, it sometimes takes a few years, five years, ten years for people to say, now I understand why it was built. You could open this a year later, two years later, five years later, but at some point in time, you've got to do something like this if you want to control the way your uh, city is going to grow. It's going to impact where people choose to work, where people choose to live, recreational opportunities, whether it's being able to access facilities you might not have gone to before or being able to make use of theater or restaurants and, and all of those types of activities. I think people are going to see new ways to use ION to let them do more and better with all those types of activities. One of the things I'm really glad about the conversations we've had about LRT over the years is I think it's helped a lot of folks to start to think longer term about where we're headed and not just in sort of a way where it happens to the community, but really the community saying, where do we want to go together and how are we going to invest in that and work towards it? We're not building it for today. We're not building it for ourselves. We're building this for our kids and our grandkids. And I think that's helped keep everybody focused on why are we doing this? When you think about what were we up to, we're building a community. I went back and looked at my notes for my first presentation to Regional Council on the LRT and realized that I was talking about what kind of a community I wanted my child to live in in the future. Uh, and now, nine years later that I'm actually about to have one, uh, it's really nice to see not only our community's future coming together, but also uh, our own uh, family's future uh, and that that's all happening together. It's really exciting for me. Well, I always said that I, I was always in um, I was always in politics for my children and my grandchildren. This is part of what we need to leave our kids: is uh, a, a community that uh, we're all proud to live in, that preserves things important to us, and uh, but leaves us economically sound at the same time. Waterloo Region isn't passively waiting for our future to happen. We're taking charge of it in a conscious, concerted, deliberate way. The results were tangible. You could reach out and touch them. They took the form of offices, shops, restaurants, and homes, all springing up along the route and breathing new life into it. Tonight, we're talking about the LRT. The region of Waterloo has put a plan into place that will see growth upward instead of outward to accommodate the growing population. All tallied in the eight years since Regional Council made that hard decision and approved light rail. ION has helped move $3 billion of development out of the ground, with more to come. When ION got that green light, such an impact, such a transformation could not have been imagined. Now ION is helping shape Waterloo Region and our future. As we waited patiently, and not so patiently, for light rail to connect neighbours and communities. It's already soaked into our landscape. 
this train, this route that will shape us and move us together through life. In the morning, everything is fake.